Imagine what it would be like if there was an outbreak of a highly dangerous infectious disease in the UK right now. What measures would the UK government take? Would the people follow the measures? Would you come to this awesome conference knowing that the person sitting next to you might be infected? I'd probably be speaking to an empty room right now. Actually, I don't think I'd be here either. I would have stayed in Barcelona, far away from the outbreak. In 2009, there was an outbreak of a highly dangerous infectious disease, the H1N1 flu virus in Mexico. So let me share with you what the Mexican government did over there, which is probably similar to what the UK government or any government would do in a situation like this. So in the next five minutes, let's uh, travel in time and space to Mexico, April 2009. On April 16, 2009, several cases of the H1N1 flu virus have been confirmed in the country. So given the situation, the Mexican government declares a state of medical alert or level one alarm, which is just a recommendation, it's not a mandate for people to stay home. A few days go by and the number of H1N1 flu cases continue to increase. People are dying. The population becomes anxious. Newspapers are living with the story every day. So on April 24th, 2009, the Mexican government decides to take more serious action and declares a state, uh, a sec, a, a state of uh, second level alert. The government closes universities and schools, first in Mexico City and then in the entire country. Mass participation activities are canceled. Soccer teams play in empty stadiums. They hand face masks in the metro and other public spaces. Churches are closed. Flights to Mexico are canceled. Archaeological sites are closed to the public everywhere in the country. Major cruise lines cancel their ports of call in Mexico. It's not a good time to be a tourist in Mexico right now. A few days later, on April 29th, the World Health Organization releases a statement saying that a global flu pandemic is imminent. Now, the entire world is becoming very concerned about what is happening in Mexico and is anxiously following the, uh, the events there. There's pressure on the Mexican government to take more serious measures that will reduce the mobility of the population and that will try to contain the spread of the pandemic. So two days later, on May 1st, 2009, which is a national holiday in Mexico, the Mexican government uh, raises the alert level to level three and begins an unprecedented five-day shutdown of the entire country. Nothing to do with the US shutdown uh, recently. Everything is shut down. So all businesses, all restaurants, shops, everything except for police and emergency services. About a month later, as you might remember, on June 11th, and despite the efforts by the Mexican government, the World Health Organization declared that a global H1N1 flu pandemic, the first in the 21st century, was underway. However, both the World Health Organization and the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention have praised the actions taken by the Mexican government because they did everything they could. But the economic cost of these measures was tremendous for the, for the uh, Mexican economy. Billions of dollars, a huge hit to the tourism industry that took months, if not years, to recover. So it seems logical to ask two questions. The first question would be, did the Mexican people follow the government measures and reduce their mobility? And the second question would be, did the measures manage to slow down the progression of the disease? Because the reality is that the Mexican government didn't have any hard evidence to be able to answer these questions quantitatively. Most mobility estimates and disease propagation estimates are done by manual means, by looking at police and hospital reports, by carrying out surveys and questionnaires, and these means are slow, they don't scale, they're very expensive to collect, and they're unreliable. But today, for the first time in human history, and thanks to the existence of technology and big data, we can actually shed light uh, into these questions. So let me show you how. Raise your hands if you do not have a mobile phone with you right now. 
Okay, so that's not surprising, obviously. And actually, I see some of you holding one very <laughs> close to your bodies. Uh, but what is interesting and powerful is that if I had asked this question to an audience in Beijing or Bombay or Cairo or Lima, I would have gotten the same answer. And this is the immense power of mobile devices. We carry them with us all the time, and they are connected, leaving a digital trace behind. So they can be seen as sensors of large scale human behavior. But let me be clear about a very important and sensitive point. I'm not talking about individual surveillance. I'm not talking about knowing who you are or where you are or what you are saying or whom you're with or what you're doing. No, I'm talking about aggregating large scale data that is already anonymous. This uh, session is called tracking your signals. But in my talk, the your is in the plural sense. These are the signals of a crowd of people that are anonymous. So let me show you, just to give you a sense, the kind of data that I'm talking about and how anonymous and how aggregated it is. Let's take a look at these two videos. So the first video shows just the number of phone calls that each cell tower, actually, it's okay. I was meant to play later, but it shows the number of phone calls that each cell tower is handling in the state of Oaxaca, Mexico, right before, during, and after an earthquake hit in 2012. If you can play back the video again. So the bigger the circles, the larger the number of phone calls that each cell tower is handling. And notice the huge increase in the number of phone calls right after the earthquake hits everywhere, and particularly in the area where it hits. So what is interesting here is that we are not looking at any individual phone call. We're just counting how many phone calls each cell tower is handling, and yet you get a sense of activity over time and space, and more importantly, you can quantify it, which is something that we could never do before. If we were, if we were interested in understanding how crowds of people move, we can add another level of detail, which is the movement of the phones between the towers. So in the next video, you see the patterns of mobility in the UK. You can very clearly see the big cities, the movement between the cities, and even the flights. Again, as I said, this data is completely anonymized. There is no personal information whatsoever, and it's aggregated. It's always analyzed collectively, never individually. It's about understanding the power of collective behavior, the behavior of crowds. So coming back to the um, Mexican um, uh, case, this is the kind of data that we use to try to answer the two questions that the, that the Mexican government had. The first question was, did the measures um, manage to reduce the mobility of the population? And the second question, you know, what was the impact that the measures had on the progression of the disease? So in my research team in Telefonica Digital, back in 2008, 2009, actually more 2009, we started working on a research area that we call Big Data for Social Good. And we decided that these two questions would be interesting questions to try to answer, not only because of their scientific value, but more importantly, because of the positive impact that they could have on society. This work could also inspire and encourage others to use this kind of data to make better decisions in the future. So in the case of the H1N1 flu virus, we analyzed aggregated and anonymized mobile data of about a million phones in some of the most affected regions in Mexico. And we started with the first question. What was the impact of the Mexican government measures on people's mobility? So to be able to answer this question, we first had to estimate typical mobility of the population. And to do so, we looked at data prior to the H1N1 flu outbreak. And then we compare that typical mobility to the mobility that we measure during each of the alert periods during the outbreak. And there were three main findings. The first finding was that during the first level of alert, which was just a recommendation, it wasn't an enforcement, there was actually no significant impact in the mobility of the population. It seemed that people just continue with their lives despite the alert. The second finding was that during the second and the third periods of alert, there was a significant reduction in the mobility of the population. So that was good. It, the, the government interventions did something. But the third finding, and the most interesting, is that during the second level of alert, the reduction in the mobility of the population was larger than during the third level of alert, even though the third level of alert meant shutting down the country and with huge economic consequences. 
In particular, we found that 80% of the population significantly reduced their mobility during the second level of alert, when compared to only 55% of the population during the third level of alert. So in sum, it seems that a government merely recommending the population not to do something doesn't seem to work. Not enough people listen to go the government's advice. But the government intervening does have an effect, and especially the interventions take place during regular working days. Interventions that take place during holidays, such as during the third level of alert, seem much more costly and less effective. So given that we found a significant reduction in the mobility, we can move on to the next question, which is, did the measures manage to slow down the progression of the disease? So to be able to answer this question, we simulated the mobility of about two million people. And we ran two simulations of the evolution of a disease outbreak using state-of-the-art epidemiological computer models. The orange graph shows the results of the first simulation. In this simulation, we show the percentage of uh, infected agents or people um, assuming the mobility, like the typical mobility, the mobility of the population before any of the government measures. As the, in other words, this shows how the disease would have evolved if the government had done nothing. The red line that just appeared shows the results of the simulation when we introduced the reduced mobility that we measured because of the government. Uh, uh, interventions. So as you can see, the peak of the, of the uh, infection was reduced by 10% and was postponed by almost two days. And you might think this is a very minor impact, but in the context of a pandemic, this can be very significant. It is important to reduce the peak of the infection because usually medical services are put under maximum stress at the peak of the infection. Delaying it by almost two days means time gained to order drugs, to mobilize staff, to prepare the beds, and reducing it by 10% could translate into thousands of people staying healthy. We did a final, um, uh, a final study which was analyzing the levels of activity around three key infrastructures, a university campus, an airport, and a hospital complex. We found that the university campus was the first to empty out. The measures worked. But we think that any measure will have worked because the students are always looking for an excuse not to go to class. <laughs> Interestingly, we found that there was an increase in activity around the airport during the second level of alert, which could actually accelerate the spread of the disease as people were trying to escape to go to other cities and other countries. And also, interestingly, we didn't find any significant changes in activity around the hospital complex during any of the three alert periods. So it seemed that the alerts didn't push the population into like a frenzy of hospital visits, which is good. So from this last study, it would seem that devoting resources to monitoring airports would make sense. This was just a small research project by two researchers in my team, and yet we managed to get to these very interesting findings that are relevant to governments and um, you know, public health institutions. But it's just a small project. It's just a seed. For this to become something larger, we will need to work with the public institutions that are the ones that know the realities of the countries and that also have the decision-making power so they can implement some of these measures. And we would also need to combine this kind of mobile data with other types of data. So we have a richer and a more um, uh, profound sort of like understanding of reality. As you have heard today, we live in a, in a world that is rich with data. So there are many different kinds of data that we could combine from traffic and transportation data to weather, hospita hospital data, emergency services data, et cetera. So imagine the potential of combining or of analyzing larger scale multi-source data sets in collaboration with experts. This seed could actually grow into a tree. And it's actually starting to grow. We have ongoing collaborations right now with United Nations Global Pulse, with the World Food Project, with the Mexican government, and with MIT. We are working on collaborative projects. For example, we are right now doing a project to understand the impact that natural disasters have on the most vulnerable. We are also doing a project to see how crop disease affects migrant workers. And we are developing an early warning system to detect unusual events 
that involve massive movements of people. In addition to these focus collaborations, which are sort of like the branches in our tree, we would actually like to help plant a forest, a forest of big data for social good. We recognize the immense value that this data has so others can make discoveries about large-scale human behavior, and these discoveries can be used to make better decisions that affect us all. So we are opening up some of this data, aggregated and anonymized, so other institutions and other research teams can work with us in these kinds of problems. We are pollinating the world with these ideas and joining forces with others. So if any of you is interested in this topic, please send me an email and we'll be happy to talk. Um, in fact, in September, we carried out our first data thon for social good here in London at the campus party in collaboration with the Open Data Institute. Twelve teams analyzed both mobile aggregated and anonymized data together with open data, for example, transportation data, Twitter, emergency services locations data, hospital data, and they came up with a lot of really interesting projects, including a crime prediction pro uh, project and a proposal for sustainable commuting. We live in a world of data. I think this is obvious, and other speakers have talked about it. But I think my biggest point is that we can use this large-scale data to have a positive impact in the world while preserving privacy. And I think that's where this anonymized, aggregated data comes to play a role. We should be able to work together, the private and the public sector, to harness big data for massive, positive social change, both safely and responsibly. I encourage you to think about how in your corporations and institutions you might also be able to leverage big data, big data for a social purpose. When you think of big data, I hope and I wish that you would think about its potential to make the world a better place. I do.